thank you very much for the opportunity to address the General Counsel. I, um, I want to keep my remarks relatively short, if I can, because I'm, I, I want to give you the opportunity to set the agenda and to ask me questions about anything that you would like to ask of me. Um, uh, I'm very pleased that I've got Charlie um, uh, presenting the previous uh, record of the university for two reasons, really. One is it's extraordinarily positive, and I hope you get the sense that the university is in a really good place. And so for me, as the incoming principal, to come to a university that's in that condition is an, an enormous privilege, much appreciated by me, um, and, uh, and, and of no credit to me whatsoever. So to have Charlie to set the scene like that was, was great, and, and it's a tribute to Tim, uh, to Charlie, Sarah, and everybody else um, who's got the university to this point. And I'm very much uh, conscious that my job is, uh, first and foremost, not to screw it up. Um, so I will try and do that. Um, so um, I, my intention is to make, if I'm referring to my phone, I've been very modern and made my notes on my phone, um, so I, I, my intention is to uh, give you a few words of introduction about myself and about my wife Tina, who you'll meet at lunchtime, um, say a little bit about the um, first impressions of the University of Edinburgh that I've managed to form over the years before I got directly involved, obviously I'm very aware of the University um, but I've got a bit more interested in the last uh, year and a half, for obvious reasons, um, and uh, say a little bit about some of the challenges, some of which have been touched on by, by Charlie and indeed by Stuart in his earlier report. Um, and I want to say one or two things about my first priority, but I, my first priorities, but um, clearly I'm at a major disadvantage. Every single person in this room knows the University of Edinburgh better than I do. Um, and so all I can really comment on is my impressions as an outsider the principles and the experience that I bring from some of my previous jobs, some lessons learned, um, and I hope some uh, exciting areas that we might talk about in the future. Um, before I forget, I wanted to comment on two things about Charlie's uh, presentation. In fact, three things. The first thing I wanted to say, uh, it's quite nice to get the opportunity to publicly thank Charlie and Sarah in particular, a number of other people in the university, but those two in particular have done a magnificent job on behalf of the university in the last 13 months because it's 13 months since I was offered the job. It's a very long time and in that 13 months uh, the two of them have, have used excellent judgment in uh, when to tell me something or involve me in something and when not to because I still had a big job to do in Hong Kong. I appreciated not being expected to start doing the next job before I'd finished the previous one uh, but they've been extremely good at keeping me informed, involving me where it was appropriate to be involved um, and, and just keeping me uh, up to speed on some of the um, issues that would uh, affect my tenure. And I should also say that Tim O'Shea was very gracious in, in his attitude as well. He, again, he was willing for me to be involved uh, even before I'd actually taken up the job and whilst he was still in post. And I'm very grateful to all of them for that. Um, on Charlie's uh, presentation, I learned uh, something this morning. I did not know that I'm now the principal of a university that is a world expert on pigs in heat. Um, so, um, thank you very much for that piece of information. Um, and the other slide that really struck me was this one. Um, uh, this, is a, this is the slide um, that says the heading is Top 20 Non-UK Domicile on Entry. And it shows, the um, first of all, the extraordinary international range of student recruitment to the University of Edinburgh. Um, and it shows these extraordinarily, bar, these extraordinarily disproportionately large bars at the top representing China and the United States. So I'm looking at Chris Cox, because what I see when I look at that slide is an army of alumni all over the world, including in China and the United States. These are currently students, but it won't be long before they become alumni, and members of General Council, ambassadors for the university. This is an illustration of the global power of this university, because you have recruits from all over the world, including very interesting parts of the world, China, on which I have some recent experience, United States, which at least at the moment is still the foremost economic power uh, in the world, um, uh, uh, plus a range of other countries. And, and I just think that is a very significant illustration of the current status of the university, but also of its future potential. And that's the kind of thing that I want to build on and capitalize on, because to me that's symbolically very important. So just wanted to make that point. Um, so, uh, who is Peter Matheson? Um, what can I tell you? Um, I, um, I went to school in Cornwall, um, uh, 10 miles from Land's End. So, Penzance is the last major town when you travel southwest, and I went to school in Penzance. My mother lives, or lived, 
uh, and I lived when I was at school five miles from Penzance. So my mother's house had sea within five miles on three out of the four sides. And we lived in a very remote um, part of Cornwall, a very long way from anywhere else. Um, and I didn't like it very much when I lived there because I thought it was too far from anywhere else. I only really appreciated Cornwall when I went to university in London, uh, when I suddenly realized that actually having a home in Cornwall was quite an advantage. Um, the reason we ended up in Cornwall was an accident of, of my father's uh, premature death. My father was a um, merchant naval seaman with Trinity House, an organization which used to put people on and off lighthouses and light ships in the days when lighthouses were manned. And as a result of his work, we moved very frequently. He, he, went, he was on stations which were roughly about three years at a time. So I was born in Colchester, and when I was less than a year old, we moved to Swansea. Um, and then I lived there for three years, and then we moved to Penzance, where he was first officer on a ship called the Stella. Um, uh, and he would have been posted to another posting, probably as the captain of a, of a Trinity House ship, uh, had he lived longer than he did. But he died when I was seven years old, and so we stayed in Penzance. And if we, if we, we would not have stayed there if it hadn't been for that event. So um, I went to school in, in Penzance. Um, I'm not Cornish. You have to live there three or four generations before you're considered Cornish. Um, but Cornwall is about as close as I've got to a sort of identity in the sense that that's where I grew up and that's where I went to school. Um, I have, uh, it's been said to me that I have a surname that my accent does not deserve, um, uh, which is that um, uh, obviously I have Scottish ancestry. My father was born in Edinburgh. Um, one of my few memories of him, I have two striking memories of him in fact, I have three really striking memories of him, one of, one of which has nothing to do with Scotland. The, third, the, the one that's nothing to do with Scotland is that he did not we, want me and my brother to go to sea. He felt that he'd spent a lot of his life, because uh, he was initially a deep sea seaman, and, and he spent a lot of his life away from home, away from his loved ones, and he did not want his <coughs> sons to follow him. So at least in that, we've honored his, his wishes. Um, the other two memories I have, I remember one standing on the bridge at Aylan Donnan. Many of you will know Aylan Donnan. It's a castle on Loch Duich. Um, the Mathesons were never important enough to own their own castle, um, but they were the wardens of uh, Loch du of Aylan Donnan for the Macrae's. And we, um, my father stood on that bridge and said to my brother and I, this is where it all started 650 years ago. This is where the Mathesons come from. And that's a very important memory for me. And I've been back to Aylan Donnan a number of times since. And it's a very iconic picture, as you know. It's often used on the BBC and various other... Uh, organizations to illustrate Scotland and for me it illustrates my family uh, roots which are which I'm which are important to me and the second memory of him is standing in Edinburgh Castle surveying the city and him saying this is where I came from and every time I walk around the city of Edinburgh and I look up at the castle I think of my father and I hope that he would be proud to think that I'm now the principal of the university in his hometown so that's the sort of sentimental aspect if you like of the Matheson uh, origins and what it means to me um, I commonly say that every single good thing that's happened in my life is the result of education. Uh, and I can say that even if my wife is in the audience because I met her at university. Um, you'll meet her at lunchtime. Tina is an orthodontist. Um, we met at the London Hospital where I was doing medicine and she was doing dentistry. Um, we, we've got two children, a son and a daughter. My son is uh, married uh, and they've recently given us our first grandchild. So um, we, I, I now have a grandson who incidentally is called William Matheson which is the same name as my father which is also uh, rather nice sentimentally he's now 10 months old and uh, this week I went to London to uh, for an event which I'll refer to in a moment as uh, from the university and also a meeting of the universities UK and at the very last minute Tina decided to come with me um, and I thought oh, this is nice she wants to keep me company but actually of course there's nothing to do with that she wanted to go and visit the grandson um, and and so I I actually didn't see her for three days with us to whilst we were in London. Um, so as you've heard, um, this is a fantastic time for the University of Edinburgh. I think the university is in great shape for the next stage of its development, and I'm very uh, honored and privileged to be part of that. And I want to uh, make sure that I contribute as, as much as I can to continuing that fantastic track record. We're almost touching 40,000 students, as you, as you heard, um, and we're getting close to a billion pounds uh, turnover. So it's a very significant organization. It accounts, as I understand it, for 25% of higher education in Scotland. So the other 18 universities account for the 75% between them. <laughs> We're 25% of, of, of higher education. Uh, so we have a big uh, civic 
national and international responsibility to fulfil. The city deal, which Charlie mentioned, uh, fills me with optimism. I think it's a very good example of the university capitalising on its strengths. This university is extraordinarily good at data science. That's known all over the world. It's one of the things that accounts for the university's international reputation. And here's an opportunity to capitalise on that, get some, some money, yes, from, from the UK government and the Scottish government, also promote our interaction with the city councils and the local councils, and promote our interactions with industry in a way that universities need to do in order to remain relevant. And City Deal gives us a great opportunity. And the City Deal itself is exciting. But actually, the potential of other things that it might lead to, I think, is even more exciting. And Hugh Edmiston, Director of uh, Corporate Affairs in the university, was telling us this week that other entities are now approaching, they're coming to the university, so the, the airport authority, PwC, are coming to the university and saying, what's this city deal thing all about? Can we get involved? So, so there's proactive uh, inter interaction with other components that previously might not uh, have been directly um, uh, working with the university and may not have felt the university was terribly approachable, um, this city deal illustrates the power of uh, university's engagement with its community and I think that's really important and very exciting and again the subject of a great deal of work as others have said but Charlie and others have um, led that piece of work uh, magnificently. The event I was in London for was to receive a Queen's anniversary prize on behalf of the university. Now, I've only been here two and a half weeks, or at that time, I'd only been here two and a half weeks. So for Tim to be generous enough to allow me to be the one that received that on the, on the behalf of the university, uh, I was uh, thrilled. Um, it was awarded to, um, uh, to Jane Norman and, uh, and colleagues in the College of Veterinary Medicine, Medicine and Veterinary Medicine, um, and the, uh, the subject of the, of the work was a whole series of uh, initiatives on women's health, going from pregnancy and its prevention and, and, and its complications uh, to uh, menstrual disorders, to pregnancy-related disorders, to uh, menopausal disease, and to uh, g female cancers. So uh, right across the spectrum of women's health, the, the group in, uh, in Edinburgh have done some magnificent work. This was a 30 years' work uh, coming to fruition with societal impact, and that's exactly what's expected for a Queen's Anniversary Prize. So we were uh, amongst, uh, I think, 21 total um, further and higher education institutions to receive such an award, and I had the privilege of collecting it from uh, Prince Charles, um, uh, uh, having met his sister earlier in the morning because um, she's going to be the, uh, my, my colleague as the, as the Chancellor, obviously. Um, and so that was a fantastic uh, privilege for me. But another example of the great position that the University of Edinburgh is currently in um, we picked up this very prestigious award, which is, is, which is akin to a civic honor. honor. It's like a, a knighthood for a research group, if you like. Um, and that's very much the, um, the spirit in which it was awarded. So I was very proud to be picking that up on behalf of the university. Um, the, um, the research income Charlie mentioned, um, as I understand it, the university had record research income last year. And in the year to date this year is already ahead of last year. So that that um, that momentum and that profile of continued research improvement is really staggering. It, it means that almost certainly there's going to have to come a year when it goes down. You can't carry on going up forever. And also if the finance director was here, and I don't think he is, but the finance director would smile because I, at the meeting of court that some of you were present at, I made the point that there are two undeniable truths about higher education which not everybody appreciates and actually not, and most people in universities don't appreciate it. and indeed I didn't appreciate when I was predominantly a researcher which I was until um, I was foolish enough to take on administrative roles in the University of Bristol which I did a few years ago um, and that is that research actually loses money so whilst research um, is the main determinant of a university's international reputation and is something that we all take enormous pride in and we want to continue and we want the research income to grow the reality is that research does not pay for the bills. Research does not pay for the lights to come on and for the university to function. Those running costs are, are largely um, uh, subserved by, by teaching and by other activities of the university. So teaching subsidizes research, but research is the main determinant of a university's reputation. And if you want any illustration of why teaching and research are mutually interdependent, that's an economic one, if you like. There's a thousand other reasons why 
teaching and research are interdependent and we have to aim to be excellent at both and not have this any sense of having to choose to prioritize one or the other they are indivisible in my opinion um, and there are many uh, examples of the reasons for that but the, but the economic one is is, is true um, so those those two undeniable truths that it's the research which determines your reputation and it's the teaching which pays the bills are uh, central to my I, my thinking about the way a comprehensive university should be managed and should be uh, should be run and should plan for the future. Um, the um, what about the challenges? Um, I, I'm certainly not an expert on on Brexit. I I, I watched um, uh, from afar as Brexit unfolded, uh, and uh, and the same about the Trump election. I was in a part of the world that felt relatively insulated from both of those uh, events, uh, although it rapidly became clear that we were not insulated from either of them. Um, but uh, Brexit clearly poses challenges to, to uh, universities in the UK, um, uh, and it's not just about recruitment of students or, and, and what the implications may be about tuition fees, and it's, nor is it just about staff. It's also about research funding, uh, it's about profile, it's about strategy. So. The, I, I spent a long time trying to look for the silver lining of Brexit, and I'm not really sure that I've found it. But um, one possible silver lining is that if the uh, if universities like this one um, realise and 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 capitalise on their potential in other parts of the world beyond Europe, then that could be a silver lining. And clearly, for me, uh, and given my recent experience, I see Asia as being a, an area that we. Uh, should build on our current activities. There are already a lot of things going on and I've learned m about that mostly since I was appointed to the job because I didn't know much about it before but there's some really interesting things going on in China and in India and other parts of the world. Um, but Asia to me is where the economic power uh, is, is developing. It, there, are, there are certainly risks and I think um, my experience in Greater China probably gives me some, uh, some degree of, of relevant experience in terms of understanding the risks but also understanding the opportunities. And I think we need to think very carefully about our strategy in China and in our strategy in other parts of Asia, but there are fantastic opportunities there. And going back to, to this graph, you know, we have 3,000 students from China currently, so that's 3,000 people uh, of, uh, of Chinese origin who can be uh, assets for us in terms of understanding what we should do with China in the future. So that's a very important message, I think. The other continent that I'm personally obsessed with is Africa. Um, I've spent uh, some very uh, happy and productive times uh, teaching, mostly teaching, doing a little bit of research in, um, in East Africa, particularly Uganda, but a number of other countries as well. And I'm very excited that, this, that the university is um, a member of the MasterCard scheme, which some of you will know about, which brings bright African graduates uh, here uh, and also encourages them to go back to their country uh, to continue their development of that of their of their of their origins uh, after their time after their studies, so that's a a very uh, worthwhile scheme. There are many other things that we can do with Africa. Engaging with Africa, a bit like engaging with China and other parts of Asia, has its risks, um, but it also has some benefits. And and the statistic I like about Africa is that of the next three billion people born on this planet, two billion of them will be in Africa. So there's an extraordinary population explosion happening in Africa and that has implications for health and implications for technology uh, data science certainly can help Africa deal with that population explosion so I think there are a number of ways in which the University of Edinburgh might productively engage with Africa uh, and, and I'm very keen to uh, to lend my weight to trying to uh, make that work for both both parties um, the, um, I've already mentioned alumni. I, 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 I think I used to describe the University of Hong Kong as being um, intermediate in its attitude and its success with alumni relations, including philanthropic giving, but not certainly not restricted to philanthropy. Um, it's, it was intermediate between a British university and an American university. So American universities obviously have a very complex and successful machinery for alumni relations and for fundraising and for philanthropic, philanthropic giving. Um, British, many British universities are not as well developed in that sense and, and bodies like this one and the body that we used, the analogous body that we used to have in the University of Bristol which we, we used to call convocation um, is one mechanism for engagement with alumni but uh, I, th I think it was Stuart that said that he was glad that the, the 220,000 people that could be here uh, hadn't all registered their intention to attend because Clearly, that would be a logistical problem, but it is a—it's a useful thought. You know, you've got alumni all over the world, 
uh, many of whom won't be in Edinburgh and won't be able to be in Edinburgh. But how do we engage with them? How do we make sure that they remain engaged with the university? Personally, I think that should start certainly whilst they're students, probably even before they become students, you know, when we first start talking to them in schools. So actually the alumni engagement has to start very early and, and most alumni will not be in a position to be philanthropic givers for the early parts of their careers. So later on they may become financial supporters of the university but they can do so much to support the university before they reach that point. It's about mentorship, it's about internships in their businesses, it's about being uh, critical friends or, 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 or contact points for us both within uh, Edinburgh and further afield and, and as, as we've seen all over the world. So I'd like to see um, a lot of development of the alumni uh, relationships and I know that a lot of work's already going into that and in fact Chris and I uh, met a couple of times in Hong Kong before I was wearing this hat. Uh, so we have had the opportunity to discuss some, some aspects of alumni relations and philanthropic uh, fundraising. About 10% of my annual income at the University of Hong Kong was from philanthropy. Um, so that was about, so the annual, the turnover of the University of Hong Kong is about 8 billion Hong Kong dollars, so that's about 800 million pounds, um, and we used to bring in about 80 million pounds equivalent in philanthropic uh, income, um, which is uh, much higher than, than any British university. So um, we, were, we were fortunate in receiving a lot of philanthropic income, and I hope that I can bring some of the learning from that uh, with me. I think I've now overcome the British reserve about asking. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's quite tricky, but, uh, but when you're in Hong Kong, you learn that um, if you don't ask, you don't get. Um, uh, so um, I, I, I want to bring some of that um, here. Um, the, there's, there's a bit of um, uh, discussion going on about how universities should articulate their value to society. Um, again, City Deal, I think, gives us an opportunity to do that, but I was at a meeting of the Russell Group um, uh, a week and a half ago, um, and the conclusion generally was that we're not very good at it. Universities are not very good at demonstrating our value to society. Um, we, we tend to be a little bit, um, uh, and, and this is not any individual university, I think this is universities in general all over the world, we tend to be a little bit uh, comfortable in our own world. We think we're doing great things. Lots of people want to come and join us, so therefore we must be doing great things. But what about demonstrating value for money? What about, dem we are a public organization, uh, we also receive tuition income uh, from uh, parents and, and families and students that have made major sacrifices in order to fund their education and we are increasingly being called upon to demonstrate that we provide value for money and I think that's a challenge to universities which at the moment universities are not terribly good at so we need to think about how we articulate our value to society and uh, as I say City Deal gives us one opportunity but there are many many other ways it's not just about educating uh, students a really important uh, statistic which was discussed at the Russell Group meeting is that at, at, at maximum probably 50% of school leavers will go into tertiary education and the question to ask ourselves is what about the other 50% what do we mean to them what do we mean to their quality of life what do we mean to their world how can we demonstrate value to people that actually don't come to university that's an important challenge because we do have uh, the privilege of receiving some of the brightest and, 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 and most capable uh, uh, school leavers and, and also fabulously capable staff. But there's a whole part of society that never directly engages with the university and we have to serve them too. So that's a really important uh, uh, challenge to us, I think. Um, I don't want to talk too much about the balance between teaching and research. I mean, you've heard uh, uh, Charlie describe some of the um, uh, major policy shifts, including major funding efforts that have preceded my arrival here. So I'm very conscious that um, the university is uh, investing in, in, in putting its money where its mouth is, if you like, and investing in aspects of student experience which are aimed to try and improve the student satisfaction scores which we currently receive, which are discordant with the standing and the excellence of the university. And that's something that I think we need to continue to pay attention to, something I care about. I also care about widening participation. And, you know, I came from a widening participation background myself, and I've already said that I attribute everything good that's happened to me to my opportunities to uh, go to university. So I want to bring those opportunities to other people. Uh, that's my goal, if you like. Um, so widening participation, I think, is important. But if it was easy to solve, it would have been solved long ago. Uh, many people are working very hard to try and understand the issue and try and work and try and improve it 
and I'll join that that uh, that battle because it's something I passionately believe in, if only because of b feeling grateful for the opportunities that I was myself uh, given. Um, if I think about specifics about the University of Edinburgh, it's too early really for me to uh, comment too much about specific aspects of of what I want to pay attention to, what I think needs change and what doesn't need change. But I would say I don't foresee the need for any major structural reorganisation. Um, I've long been an admirer of the Scottish College model. I think it works well in Edinburgh. It hasn't worked well in all universities in Scotland. But um, when I arrived at the University of Hong Kong and I found that the university had 10 faculties and about another 10 uh, entities which were not faculties but they were institutes or centres of various other things, um, one thought I had was should I restructure it into a, a Scottish style model of colleges um, and I decided not to because I didn't think it would uh, I thought it would be a distraction and I didn't think it would be uh, it, would, it would solve anything and what I tried to do whilst I was there was promote interdisciplinarity across this very large number of entities which previously had been each been run like a little empire um, uh, and, and we made some progress on that but the Scottish College model um, is, is, a, is a, a model that's much admired uh, by me and others around the higher education world and I don't see any reason to change it. So I don't foresee anything major in terms of structure needing to be altered. Um, there may be a slight shift in cultural emphasis about um, uh, this so-called pendulum between teaching and research and maybe the pendulum has been a little bit tipped towards research in the past and certainly in the minds of some of the staff thinking that the only way they can progress their careers is by research achievement and everything else is secondary. Uh, Charlie illustrated nicely, I think, with some of the awards, the way the university is countering that view. But it's not uncommon among staff in research intensive universities to feel that the only way they can impress the leadership and get promoted or get jobs elsewhere or get pay rises is through research achievement. And whilst that's true, research achievement is very important, we need to prize excellence in teaching and excellence in knowledge exchange and the various other things that the the university aims to deliver uh, for our staff because that's very much, in my opinion, the mission of a modern research intensive university. Um, the um, third aspect of university function, which doesn't get talked about quite so much, we always talk about teaching, we always talk about research. The third aspect that we used to talk about in, um, in my previous existence was knowledge exchange. And this really means um, a bi directional. Uh, exchange with society. So this is knowledge coming into the university but also knowledge going out. And I just wanted to mention one piece of work done by the University of Hong Kong. I don't want to constantly go on about Hong Kong because um, I know that the, a lot of the context of Hong Kong is not relevant to uh, my future uh, uh, aims and, 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 and needs. But um, the University of Hong Kong has a project called Project Mingda and um, it's, it's a project uh, designed for experiential learning for its students. And it takes place in a rural part of China uh, called Guangxi. So Guangxi is a western province, uh, very mountainous, uh, mostly populated by ethnic minorities and very poor. And um, a, the engineering faculty at the University of Hong Kong about 11 or 12 years ago started a project in rural Guangxi where engineering students would go and um, speak to the local communities and say, what is it that you really need? And, and how can we help? And, and the, idea, the, the answer was that what they really needed was schools. And so the engineering faculty has built a series of schools in, little, in ethnic minority villages in the mountains of Guangxi. And I went up there for the 10th anniversary to celebrate the 10th anniversary of this project. And I had a, uh, it's a long winding road up through the hills to get to this place. And I traveled up with a, with a Hong Kong U student. And some of the... Um, remarks that he made, and I have his permission to, uh, to, to repeat his remarks. Some of his remarks were very, uh, for me, very uh, important in understanding the value of experiential learning, of knowledge exchange, of getting students outside their comfort zones into places in the world where they didn't necessarily think that they wanted to go because there's mutual benefit in educational terms for them and also whatever good they can do to society. And this boy, whose name was Samson, said to me, the first time he was asked to go to Project Mingda, he didn't want to go. He was born and brought up in Hong Kong. He was fearful of China. He thought if he went to China, he might get arrested or he might just disappear or someone might try to indoctrinate him or he might get ill or he might not like the food. He had all sorts of uncertainties about why it was not a good idea for him to go. But he went because he was expected to go by his teachers and because there was peer pressure to go. And what he said was that going there 
changed his outlook on the world, and cha in particular changed his outlook on China. And without getting involved in the politics between Hong Kong and China, there's no question that a lot of Hong Kong students are very suspicious of China and very anxious about going to China. And what Samson said was he went there and he realized two things. Firstly, he realized that these people he's working with are all Chinese like him. So they, they're all, they, they look the same, they may speak a different language, but they're basically like him, they're just normal people, they're not some uh, uh, strangers that he can't interact with. And secondly, he felt empowered by the fact that he had some knowledge that he could bring to their benefit, and he'd never realized that before. And I think this is an example of the way universities sometimes underestimate their ability to contribute to society. These students, even though he was at that time only a first-year engineering student, he knew that some things about how to design a building and how to uh, create something in a difficult circumstance that was of value to that community. And then the, the final point that he made was that, he, in, his, in his opinion, um, the, ben the, the net benefit of this arrangement, and he kept on going back and encouraging others to go and not have the kinds of fears that he'd originally had, the net benefit was very much to him. So he said, yes, okay, we've built some schools, and yes, okay, we've improved their facilities. But the value it's given us as students and as citizens is unmeasurable. And I just think that was a very nice example of the power of knowledge exchange and the power of experiential learning. And that's something that I'd like to see uh, further developed for our students. Um, so I'm going to uh, stop at that point um, and invite you to ask me any questions. I just want to thank you for all that you have done for the university in the past for all that you currently do and for all that you will do in the future. Um, and, and, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to address you at this very early stage of my time here. I look forward to working with everybody that loves and cares about the University of Edinburgh uh, to try and uh, enhance the, the, the status even beyond the lofty level at which it currently sits. Um, I, I regard that as a big responsibility uh, and a big privilege, and I'm delighted to be here. Thank you very much.